Welcome back to the Dairy Podcast Show. Uh, I'm Barry Bradford from Michigan State University. And today I'm pleased uh, to welcome uh, someone I've known for quite a while, Dr. Glenn Holub. Dr. Holub is an executive dairy technology manager with Fibro Animal Health. Glenn was raised on a small dairy farm on the Texas Gulf Coast. He received his BS, his master's of agriculture and his doctoral degrees from Texas A&M University in animal and dairy science. And he then served as a county extension agent for 12 years. Uh, before he moved on to become a lecturer and faculty manager of the Texas A&M Dairy Cattle Center for five years, then as a feed company nutritionist and quality control specialist with Land Lakes Purina and Gores Incorporated for five years, and then as a professor of animal science at Texas A&M for eight years, until nine years ago, he joined Fibro Animal Health in his current role. And Glenn noted that each and every one of these positions over 39 years of his career has developed his thought process and his ideals for the dairy industry from various points of view. Glenn, thanks for joining us on the show today. I didn't know all the details of your career career path. It's been a, a really interesting um, set of roles you've had. I'm curious if if you can reflect on what what's the most difficult job you've ever had out of that list. Or maybe it's off the list. Maybe it was when you were eight years old milking cows at home. I don't know. That's a good attitude. I suppose it's a lot about your mindset, right? More so than anything else. That's right. <laughs> Sounds good. So you grew up milking cows, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's probably about as hot and humid a climate as you can find in the U.S., right? Absolutely. And that's, so that's what I thought we could uh, spend some time on today is heat stress. It's the right time of year to be talking about that, right? Um, so we should start with, you know, we're talking about the Gulf Coast of Texas. It, I think everybody would agree it's hot there. But one question that always comes up, especially if you're in my part of the country, like Michigan, um, is this really just an issue that people in the, say, the southern third of the U.S. need to worry about? Or, you know, where do we need to think about heat stress? Thank you. 
Is there a way to quantify that? So like, let's say, for example, every everybody's a little different, right? Like to me, a perfect temperature is maybe 76 degrees, you know, modest humidity. Um, you know, what's a kind of range? I know humidity plays in, so it becomes a little more difficult. But what's what's kind of a number um, where we need to start thinking about cows having heat stress? Yeah, absolutely. And one thing I learned in, I got involved in some heat stress research where we had um, 24 hour data on body temperatures on cows. And it was really bizarre to me when I first helped start analyzing that data, how there would be a huge lag in body temperature. And so, you know, obviously, typically temperatures start dropping about 5 p.m., right? It depends on what time of year. But um, their peak body temperature really wouldn't stop dropping until midnight, 1 a.m. a lot of times. What's that all about? Maybe you understand the biology better than I do. Yeah. Maybe we should maybe circle back to that in a minute, but I will, um, let me step back to the regions again. I kind of blitzed past that. Um, you know, in my experience in the northern part of the U.S., that many people are now convinced that investing in cooling uh, equipment is a good ROI, but not everybody is. So if you get challenged on that from somebody in the northern third of the U.S., that you know, what's the evidence that cows in my region are actually affected by heat stress? What's the, what's your go-to answer there? Thank you. 
Yep. Good answer. And then um, th this is a, an interesting question. Of course, it, it's going to vary massively by region, but how do we assess within a given context what times of the year are are there times that the cows are actually experiencing heat stress? No, those are a, a lot of good highlights. So, yeah, she, she, like you said, unconsciously, she's going to adapt by changing her behavior in a way that's going to maybe limit heat production and, and maximize heat dissipation. Are there any other things going on? Uh, how else is she going to respond that, again, we maybe can't observe? I mean, 
I want to get to, you know, why is she end up making less milk? Why is she end up being less fertile? That sort of thing. I don't know that there's any strong data for this, um, but I've had a number of conversations. Anecdotally, people who really track heat stress um, will pretty consistently tell me that they think cows get hit harder by a mild early season heat stress than sort of ongoing heat stress, say in July. And we've speculated about, you know, there's some there has to be some seasonal adaptation. Um, cows, some, to some degree, have to adapt to the cooler weather. And then when you get a pretty warm week in, say, March, um, it really seems like cows get hammered. Is that what you've observed? Do you agree with that, that idea? Yeah. And I think that that can be, I think that's kind of true independent of management. But I think what can make that even worse is particularly if you have to do a lot of work to sort of get ready for summer and, you know, a warm stretch hits and, and then you're starting to think about field work and all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, we don't really have our fans or our sprinkler set up. And uh, anyway, that's a good lead in to um, we're talking about all these sort of dire situations. Let's think about how we can help. Right. So. So compared to when you were a kid, I think the um, 
the world of engineering has that kind of helped us with a lot of tools. And um, certainly a lot of people have done some good work on how do we make the cow's heat dissipation mechanisms work as well as possible? What can we do externally? So talk me through that if you would. Like what are the top five tools or strategies that we should be using? Thank you. 
One um, sort of rule of thumb I was going to ask you about, you mentioned that um, sort of we've learned over the years that it takes actually a lot of airflow, a lot of velocity to have much of an impact. Um, is, there a, is there a number that you keep in your back pocket? Of course, it always depends, right? But Yeah, okay, fair enough. And I don't know, you know, engineers might cringe, but um, from the really good tunnel and cross vent barns I've been in when it's real hot out, like often the airspeed is something like eight to 10 miles an hour. It's, it's not trivial, right? So it takes a lot of fan power. Um, but it has a big impact on cows. Um, I, it might also be worth mentioning, um, if people haven't spent much time thinking about this, um, you mentioned the, the evaporative uh, cooling systems in, in the Southwest. I always think of those as like Arizona systems. Um, maybe it's worth going into, you know, why those are not used uh, so much in Missouri, for example. Right, in Florida, yeah. I think um, it's it's been, well, I, I think there's a couple of things that people have been evolving toward. One I want to mention briefly is that idea of that uh, sort of lag phase in, in body temperature. And I think the better managers in this space are, instead of just having the systems turn off based on the air temperature, you know, they're sort of building in a lag and they'll have cooling systems running in the night, even when the employees that might be out there might be straight up cold, <laughs> but those cows are still dissipating daytime heat at that point, right? So that's, I think, the big thing. Yeah. Thank you. 
The other thing that I think has changed a lot in the last, oh, 10 years or so is um, people saw pretty early, I think, because of milk yield and whatever, the impacts of cooling lactating cows. But because of a lot of the work done at Florida, University of Florida, Jeff Dahl and others, um, has really made it clear the impact of heat stress in dry cows. So I've really seen a lot of people sort of reinvesting in that sort of dry cow barn that was ignored for a lot of years. Is that what you've seen too? All right. Well, is there is there one important impact of heat stress that you think most people overlook or ignore? Sort of on the flip side, are there are there strategies you see that people have sort of passed down through the years and keep using that you think are just a waste of time or maybe even counterproductive? I'm just curious. Thank you. 
Our Yeast 40 is a natural biotechnology firm, ICC, designed to boost the health and productivity of animals under challenging production systems. Our Yeast 40 performance is supported by an unique processing technology that results in a pure product containing high levels of beta-glucans, MOS, and yeast metabolites. These factors, combined, promote the ruminal and intestinal modulation, helping the animals to reach their full potential. Okay, we've come to our famous three questions we ask everybody. Uh, first of all, what's your favorite dairy-related book or resource? I appreciate that. Great. What about your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture? <laughs> Good for you. All right, last but not least, in your opinion, what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are less successful? Fantastic. Thanks for sharing your thoughts, Glenn. I enjoyed that conversation. This has been another episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. If you haven't followed us yet, uh, don't forget to click that button so you don't miss the next episode. And until next time, take care.